appointments they're making for the worship in the temple are spiritual appointments and that they're not made with some kind of, you know, personal or private uh, or emotional mindset, you know. And truth be told, that got me thinking. You know, as you look out at the world today, it seems like a lot of the appointments being made in the church are being made that way, personal, private, emotional. And so I thought, you know, a great way to deal with that would be to share a Days of Lot alert. You know, we haven't had one for a little while, and I think it fits nicely into our, you know, text here this morning. You need to know what the Bible says about the days that you're living in. You know, we are living in very trying times. We're living in, a, in an era where, you know, good is called evil and evil is called good. Uh, and so not just knowing that the Bible speaks about that, but, you know, when we can accurately determine, hey, this is what the Bible says and these are the days that we're living in, we can act accordingly. You see, uh, the Bible, you know, God uses this book to teach us how to, you know, make our way through this world. And we'll talk about that, you know, just as we go on in our text. But you can clearly see that, you know, not all churches are using the Bible as that kind of road map, you know. Uh, actually, in the church today, I would suggest to you that there are more unbiblical appointments than there are biblical ones. And so I think that in and of itself is worth talking about. And so I want to consider a list of, you know, a few of the famous pastors out there. Listen, you hear me say this a lot. Let's stop looking at men of God and let's look to the God of men. You know, when you focus on men of God, you can lose track of God. And I think oftentimes it's even staged that way within the church. You know, God wants us to have our eyes on him, and yet there are a lot of pastors, you know, and I use that word very loosely in talking about some of these men, who uh, make statements that have nothing to do with God's word. And so I thought it would be a good place to start Andy Stanley. Um, Andy Stanley is a very popular pastor. He's got one of the larger churches in America. There's about 30,000 people that meet weekly uh, in Atlanta at his church uh, for worship. And yet, I want to share a few things that he says. And I'm actually going to give you direct quotes from each of the people I'm going to talk to you about because I don't want to, you know, twist it and, and make it seem one way or the other. I'm just going to share with you what they say and let you decide. Let's look at it against the Word of God. Andy Stanley's noted for saying, Christianity does not need propping up by the Jewish scriptures. Peter, James, and Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from the Jewish scriptures. And my friends, we must as well. First of all, that's absurd. Um, thinking that these men, you know, Peter, James, and Paul, unhitch the Christian faith from the Old Testament, absolutely ridiculous. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, there are literally hundreds of references to the Old Testament. Many of those are direct quotes. Now, these men themselves, in, in the book of 2 Peter, uh, there's over 12 references to Old Testament texts just in that one book alone. Uh, James, for instance, uh, James chapter 2 has six references to the Old Testament. Six. When you, cut, when you talk about the Apostle Paul, I mean, just in the book of Romans, he references Old Testament scripture over 20 times. In the totality of his writings, it's over 40 that he, you know, directly references, let alone the various times they allude to Old Testament scriptures. Uh, listen, in relation to that statement, Andy Stanley wrote in his book, the book title is Irresistible. This is page 136. He wrote, the Ten Commandments have no authority over you. None. To be clear, thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments. Wow. Um, that's pretty biblical. Actually, it's counter-biblical, isn't it? Now, Jesus did say, I didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets. I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. 100%. We're not living under the law. But we don't tear those pages out and throw them away, do we? No, as a matter of fact, the law is there for a very good reason, and it continues to benefit the church today. What is that reason? Well, it's there to convict us of sin, right? And it's there to convince us that we need a Savior. We need a Savior, and it's not you, right? I mean, it's not me. Jesus Christ. The law convicts us of sin, convinces us we need a Savior. Now, the Ten Commandments are part of the law, certainly not the totality of it. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Does that just mean New Testament Scripture? Does that just mean the Gospels or just the Epistles? No, all Scripture, 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. It is all, literally the word inspiration, it's the breath of God. 
And it's profitable, church, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture. Andy Stanley's known for a Christmas message in 2016 where he said this. You've, had, you've heard me say some version of this a million times, but if somebody can predict their own death and resurrection, I'm not all that concerned about how they got into this world because the whole resurrection thing is so amazing. And in fact, you should know this, Christianity does not hinge on the truth or even the stories about the birth of Jesus. It really hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. He goes on to say in the same, a few moments later, maybe they, meaning the disciples, maybe they had to come up with some myth about the birth of Jesus to give him street cred later on. Wow. I mean, so I must be mistaken. I thought Old Testament scripture referencing the birth of Jesus was called prophecy, not myth. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14 says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Who gave the sign, church? God. Adonai, Yahweh, right? The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Did the disciples make that up to give Jesus street cred? No. This is a man that has no place in the pulpit. And I don't say that as opinion. I believe that in my heart is truth. He has no place in the pulpit. Because of his father's ministry, he was ushered into the pulpit. Listen, Charles Stanley was a faithful minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wasn't a perfect man. I didn't agree with everything he said, and I would imagine he wouldn't agree with everything I said. But he was a good and faithful man who studied the word to share it with his church and with others. Now, Andy Stanley was raised up in ministry. Other him, there was a schism between them. He set out. Andy left the church, and it seems to me, set up his ministry in direct opposition to his father's. And yet the world goes, yay and amen. What about Stephen Furtick? A lot of people really loving on Stephen Furtick these days. Let me, let me burst that bubble for you. Stephen Furtick is known for saying, when God said, I am to Moses, you know, my name is I am. He was trying to get him to see you are as I am. Now, let's, let's unpack that for a moment. What's the story he's talking about? The scenario here is Moses at the burning bush. He's talking to God. God is telling him, you need to go to, you know, talk to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. And Moses is like, who, who is it that I should say is sending me? And he says, tell him I am sent you. Now, what he was saying was, tell him the creator of the heavens and the earth sent you. Tell him that, you know, the one who created all things, the one true living God sent you. As a matter of fact, Jesus, later on in the garden, would reference back to that. You know, when they came to take him, hey, are you this Jesus? And he said, I am. He was saying, I am that I am, the I am of the burning bush, the I am of creation. And they all fell as they stood in opposition to him. You know, Stephen Furtick twists it and says, well, God was trying to say, you are as I am, Moses. You're your own God. You're a God just like I'm a God. Moses wasn't a God. You're not a God. I'm not a God. There's one, two li one true living God. He exists in three parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Furtick also said, following Jesus doesn't change you into something else. It reveals who you've been all along. Boy, that sounds really nice, doesn't it? But it stands in opposition to Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, old things have passed away. All things have become new. Listen, you know, following Jesus changes you. There's a, trans, uh, a transformation that takes place. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote that. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, transformed, the word he used there uh, in the Greek is metamorpho. It literally is a metamorphosis that takes place from the inside out. We have to change. And if we don't, we truly don't know God. Furtick, and this one really gets me. Furtick has said this a few times. We don't teach from books of the Bible because it gets in the way of evangelism. We don't offer different kinds of Bible studies because it gets in the way of evangelism. We don't teach doctrine because it gets in the way of evangelism. If you want to be fed God's word or have the Bible explained to you, then you are a fat, lazy Christian and you need to shut up and get to work or you need to leave this church because we only do evangelism. 
Not my words, Stephen Furtick. Not my words. <laughs> Don't send me emails. Email Stephen Furtick. Listen, this is a major biblical problem. How do you evangelize without teaching Scripture? How can you possibly share the love of God with somebody if you're not teaching the doctrines of God in your church? No, Stephen Furtick isn't winning disciples for the Lord. He's winning disciples for Stephen Furtick. You know, Joyce Meyer's another easy example. So many unbiblical statements. I mean, there's a list of many here. She says, Jesus went to hell to pay the price for your sins. What does the Bible say? The Bible says he paid the price for your sins at the cross, not in hell. You know, she says, Jesus was the first born again man. No, we're the ones that need to be born again, church. As a matter of fact, Joyce Meyer, uh, more of what she says is unbiblical than not. Uh, Joel Osteen, another example. Listen, we don't even have to talk. We should talk about the things he has said that's accurate. That would take less time. You know, this is a man that I'm not even sure uh, read the Bible. Have you ever watched one of his sermons? Hey, listen, if I owned, uh, you know, Ford or, or Chevrolet or GM or something, and I wanted to, you know, you know, make people happy and have them work harder, you know, you bring in a guy like this. You know, he's a motivator, but he's not a propagator of God's word. You see, church, because there are so many churches that are embracing heresy, because there are so many churches that have unbiblical leadership models, the modern church is often denying the authority of Scripture. I mean, you have to deny the authority of Scripture if you're going to say and do things like this. They do that, and they embrace sin as a means of gaining membership. Listen, you can clearly see why it was so important for Nehemiah to follow a biblical approach to appointing positions within the temple. Hopefully you know why it's so important that we follow a biblical approach, a New Testament picture of church leadership set out for us.